Hey everyone, I'm Steve from GamersNexus.net and we are doing another episode of Ask GN. I think we might be on five now, so going pretty well. Definitely keep posting your questions about computer hardware and video games as they pertain to computer hardware in the comments below and we'll keep addressing those in the videos. Definitely some fun stuff comes out of it. So first off, there were a few questions about multi-monitors in the previous video and I did see them, I did read them, and I do want to address them but I need to do a bit of studying on some of the aspects of the questions to make sure everything is completely sound when I'm addressing them. So I will not be answering those in this video, but I did see them and I do want to talk about it. <clears throat> Things I can talk about include DirectX 12. So let's just dive into that right away. The first question today was from Nishant Shukaria, who, sorry, who said, thank you for the response, the previous question. Another question I have is about multi-GPU in DirectX 12. Some people are saying that with DX12, you can SLI or crossfire an NVIDIA GPU with an AMD GPU in a single PC, triple exclamation mark. Is it really true or are these baseless rumors? So they're not baseless rumors. Whether or not it's true sort of depends on your definition of true and how things play out as the API matures and things like that. So in theory, it is possible to have both an AMD and an NVIDIA GPU in the same system with DirectX 12 and theoretically even utilize both of those video cards for your game processing. There are a lot of problems here. One of them includes the difference of requirement for what constitutes a multi-GPU configuration by AMD and NVIDIA. NVIDIA, for instance, currently uses an SLI bridge. AMD no longer uses the Crossfire bridge. They've gotten rid of that and they go through the PCIe interface. So that certainly complicates things. But more so than that, it's just the fact that you would need software to actually be developed for such a configuration and tested for it. It's pretty unlikely that those configurations will exist, at least as it stands in the market today. So game developers won't be tuning or optimizing or testing for those really at all, which does impact the viability of that setup. It also means that you'll need things like drivers and engines to be built for such a configuration, two things that I also don't suspect will be happening in the current market. So they're not baseless rumors. It is something that theoretically can be done, but the impact in the gaming environment will be probably minimal, at least at the beginning, because it's, nothing's going to be built for it. So I certainly would not plan on coupling an AMD and an NVIDIA video card in the same system for your next build. It's not something I would plan on, but uh, it's definitely cool, and we'll be testing it as DX12 matures and things like that. So good question there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next one is from Andre who says, how about plugging in, oh, sorry, this is about the grounding cable. So I recently posted a video about how to make a grounding cable to ground yourself, meaning take all the static electricity out of your system before building a PC, and this is to protect your components from ESD, or electrostatic discharge. That known, uh, Andre here commented on that video and asked, how about plugging in the power supply with the switch on it turned to off and then touching it before you touch your hardware. I heard this works too. Is this correct? So it is correct. Uh, ESD is a tricky thing to deal with because a lot of people will just sort of tap their case as they're building and hope that that's enough. The thing is here, the case is not necessarily directly attached to a line to ground, and it's also going to be painted metal unless you're working with something like raw aluminum from Leon Lee or something. So. When you're working with any kind of painted metal, that is a much less conductive surface. So even if you're carrying a charge, you might not necessarily emit that charge to the piece of metal you're touching. And you want a direct path to ground somewhere in the system. With the grounding cable that I show you how to make in the video, you are plugging into the third prawn in US outlets. It's different in other countries. But in US outlets, it's the third prawn, it's cylindrical. You plug into that, tap the wire that's exposed and then that'll ground you through the ground socket or the, the ground pin in the wall socket. <clears throat> now hopefully the wall socket has actually been wired to ground. Some one of the viewers commented and said that in his apartment or his building or whatever the ground uh, pin in the wall sockets was not actually connected to earth. So it wouldn't work in that case which is a problem. But 
when you're looking at touching the power supply, what you can do, and this is what I've done in a pinch, is take the alligator clip from your ESD or your anti-static wrist strap, those yellow ones you wear, and clip the alligator clip to the fan grill of the power supply. This will normally be painted metal, so keep that in mind. It's the same issue, but it's much more likely to work, and you need to connect the power supply to the outlet, and then you can just toggle the switch off. So you just turn the switch off just for safety so you don't damage components by accidentally toggling power and sending power through the system when it's not ready. But toggle the switch off, plug it in, connect to the grill or something that you can grab with the, the alligator clip or really if you can touch it too, that works, but it's not something I, I like doing if I'm working with expensive components and I have killed components with ESD. And that'll get you by if you don't want to do like a grounding cable or something more complex. So yes, that is the answer is that that is correct. You heard correctly. Next question. <clears throat> Let's go Iowa. So that's a very enthusiastic way to talk about Iowa, I must say. Says, hey Steve, how likely is Vulcan adoption compared to DX12 and how do the APIs differ? So both of these questions I will be addressing in an interview with Chris Roberts tomorrow. He's the guy working on Star Citizen. There are a lot of people working on Star Citizen, but he's the, the main deal. So Chris Roberts will be talking with me about Vulcan, DirectX 12, and how they compare, the feature levels, and the applicability to his game, but of course to the, the greater market as well. For those of you who have seen the Chris Roberts videos that I've done, you know how they go. It, it sort of just gets deeper and deeper into the discussion, which is awesome. So we're going to be talking about that, but to quickly address this, Vulcan adoption faces a few challenges. The main ones are that Microsoft is a big company and Microsoft owns DirectX. Vulkan is a spin-off of OpenGL and Mantle. So it's, it's building on an existing API feature set. It has a very similar feature set to DX12 and in theory it's more open. Well it, it is more open, there's no theory about it. And that's just because of the way it's built. So the thing here is that Nvidia and Microsoft are both pushing DirectX 12 pretty hard, especially Microsoft. And that's going to be a challenge because of the way the industry works with the game developers. The game developers are ultimately who will dictate which API stays and which one is stays in a smaller capacity, basically. So as long as that exists, there's a problem with the uptake on Vulkan. And then there were rumors a while back about AMD being acquired by Microsoft. There's presently no data to support those rumors. But, theoretically, if something like that were to happen, then it would also impact the Vulkan adoption if, if Microsoft acquired AMD. Did I say it the other way a second ago? I may have said it backwards, which is not going to happen if I said AMD acquired Microsoft. The rumor was that Microsoft would acquire AMD, and if that happens, which no base to that, if it does, that will, in my opinion, potentially torpedo Vulkan very early in the process. So that would be a challenge as well. Feature set's pretty similar, but uh, we haven't really seen Vulkan in action yet, and DirectX 12 is only just now rolling. So something I'm going to be talking more with Chris about tomorrow, and we'll publish the video hopefully over the weekend. So that's what I have to say about that. Alex Maya says, is there a way I can correlate a fan speed that is connected to a PWM header, which for those who don't know means pulse width modulation. That means that the fan is controllable through the fourth pin on the fan header. And uh, he says, can I correlate the PWM fan header on my motherboard to the GPU temperature? The answer is yes. So you can use something like MSI Afterburner, EVGA Precision. I think ASUS has some kind of utility as well. You can use one of those and build a custom fan curve. The one I'm most familiar with is MSI Afterburner. You open the fan control and the, uh, the advanced settings or wherever it is, and you just drag points along a graph that have, I believe it's temperature on the temperature on the, the x-axis and then fan percentage speed on the y-axis. So if you want to say keep lower fan RPMs until you hit a more dangerous temperature like 80 Celsius, 85 Celsius, then you can build a curve that ramps the RPM almost not at all or very slowly at the lower thermals and then once it hits a really high thermal you can spike your RPM. If you're someone who's more concerned about consistency, smoothness, 
then you'll want to do a more gradual fan curve because this will impact how noisy it is perceived to you as a user. So although a higher RPM will certainly be very loud, the annoying thing to a lot of people who demand silence in a PC is actually the, uh, the difference between the time the, the fan moves from one RPM to the next. So in that case, you'll want to build a smoother fan curve, that way it more gradually increments, and you are less likely to suddenly notice something in your ear as you're trying to play a game. Uh, but yes, you can control that and you should set a custom fan curve because it's, it's pretty cool and it's a useful thing to do. Uh, the Del the Delgaticone, sorry, says, uh, ask GN, is there a shadow play equivalent on the AMD side? If not, is there any low performance hit screen recorders? Uh, yes, there is an AMD equivalent and it is called GVR. It is made by Raptor. Raptor hired the Radeon Pro guy to help work on it. And GVR is something we've tested. You can search the channel for shadow play or GVR or fraps. If you search any of those three things, you'll find the video I did. And GVR has improved a bit since then, but it is a much lower impact than something like fraps, which just eats CPU. It really doesn't do anything with GPU parallelization, which is a big problem for fraps. So GVR is more similar to shadow play. GVR is also compatible with NVIDIA devices. I, there's no real reason you would use it over shadow play, especially because the performance delta is a little bit worse when using GVR, but it's possible. And uh, I, I guess there's a real reason to use it. The real reason would be if you don't have a device that supports shadow play, but you have an NVIDIA device, like something that's not on Kepler or Maxwell, something maybe Fermi, for example, a 400 series video card. So that's how that works. Uh, GBR, I can't remember off the top of my head how big the impact was, but that video will tell you. And I know that shadow play had an impact of between two and 4% to your FPS. So it eats about two to 4% to do that in code. And that's because it goes onto a separate H.264 encoder on the GPU die on the chip. Uh, GPU or GBR rather does a similar thing. It uses AMD's on chip encoder. So very similar technology, similarly low impact, but it did have a bit more impact in some places than others where, where NVIDIA was more consistent. But it's, it's something I would recommend if you want to do screen capture without using fraps. Uh, so that is the solution there. Those are the really shadow play GBR are the best items. There are other screen recorders and I'm sure a few of you know them. If you do post them below, cause I'm curious, I'm not too familiar with recorders outside of those two. I know there's Hypercam, there's Camtasia, stuff like that, but I don't know that they're GPU accelerated and I know Hypercam is not great for game capture. So that's where my knowledge is on that. Check back soon for the Chris Roberts interview, all the other stuff. This video might actually go up after I interview him. Interviews on Friday this week. So this video might go up like a day uh, after that, but either way, check back for it. Check back for all the other stuff. And thank you to the now 15 patrons we have on Patreon. It is a huge help to see you guys supporting the content directly like that. I am sincerely appreciative and it's encouraging because hopefully it helps us upgrade some of our equipment here. Uh, I've ordered, <laughs> I have a new chair, which you can't see from this camera angle really, but we have two of these. We have a table, so it's a living large here, and those will be used for multi-person video casts, which I'm actually really excited about getting at least one other person involved so we can talk hardware or games or whatever, do sort of a round table discussion. Then we've got a set wall that's coming in too. Uh, so this is a, a gray sheet, as you would put on your bed. But we're ordering a wood wall that's paneling and going to build it. It'll look really cool. Pretty excited about that. And I'm ordering two new lights so we get rid of this shadowing right here that some of you have commented on. So things are, are exciting right now, and a lot of that's because of the support from just viewing and commenting and, of course, the direct support from Patreon. Uh, check all that out in the post roll video. Thanks again for watching. Let me know what your next questions are for the next video, and I'll see you all next time.